Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Thank you to all of the sponsors of our startup and innovation webinar series, including Caesar Sinai Accelerator, Deloitte, and LRV Health, who are represented on today's panel. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Deloitte, Peter Micah. Thank you, Eddie, so much. I appreciate your time. Um, my name is Pete Meek. I lead our uh, technology practice for Deloitte and extremely excited to really convene three, three panelists who all bring a, a different perspective on the emerging growth uh, companies in our ecosystem, uh, whether it be through a provider lens, a corporate uh, investor lens, or a venture capital lens, respectively. Um, recently authored a piece on uh, health tech investment trends in the future of health, uh, and many of those concepts, uh, you know, continue to be appropriate as we think about the emerging landscape. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Ann uh, and Michelle to uh, now be part of the panel. Great, thank you. Thank you so much and, and thank you, uh, Eddie. Uh, we, uh, we have a series of uh, two or three key questions that we'd like to engage our uh, participants in vis-a-vis uh, -vis the emerging health tech uh, landscape um, and get their perspectives through either the emergence of the consumer or the convergence that we see in the marketplace. Um, why don't we start uh, with, with Keith? Uh, Keith, uh, I'll let him uh, introduce himself, but we'd love to get you know, your perspective around you know, what really gets funded in today's ecosystem. We, we've gone through a year and a half of the emergence of you know, COVID-19, you know, really bringing health technology to the forefront and awareness of, of the ultimate consumer. Uh, how is that changing? What gets funded? How do you look at that as you, as you think about the future of health? Sure. Thanks, Pete. Um, I'm Keith Figlioli, one of the partners at LRV Health. Uh, just a quick intro. Uh, we were joking before these intros can run way too long, so I will try to be as brief as possible. <clears throat> uh, but LRV Health is a unique platform in that it's a strategic venture capital platform that we have uh, 22 strategic partners uh, that are large healthcare systems, large healthcare payers, and a few large healthcare vendors. Uh, we take no financial money, so it's a complete, almost feels like a uh, independent corporate venture group to a certain degree, which is a great peer set with Michelle and Anna McCall. Um, I've been in the business for 20 plus years as an executive operator, uh, running a, a helping to run a few companies like Premier uh, and a large EHR company back in the day, um, and recently got into the investing world over the last five years. Um, but most of the people that we work with, I've had relationships with for decades uh, in terms of professional relationships with. So, so that, that brings me to sort of the question, which, um, you know, from a unique point of view, we see a lot of trends sort of front and center with our strategics. And I think everybody, you know, what's getting invested, I think a lot of people know sort of the, the mainstream concepts, which, you know, things like mental health, behavioral health have been sort of very hot as of late. Uh, women's health has been uh, also on a tear uh, for the last little bit. Um, but I, I guess I would step it up and say, you know, some of the things that we're thinking about, about what the, what's happening with the space, if you come up 30,000 feet, is this idea of digitally infusing sort of new, new age sort of care delivery providers, as well as new age payers, and a combination of those two things, uh, sort of to be a fancy word, the old word pay provider. And so what I mean by that is everything kind of hangs off that to a certain degree. And we spent an exorbitant amount of time and have been for a while thinking about new care delivery plays. Because if you have an incumbent, say, large healthcare system that, you know, hasn't been so far digitally le leaning outside of their EHR, their ERP, Salesforce, CRM to a certain degree, um, 
you know, a lot of these new age digitally infused providers that sit mostly on the ambulatory and the outpatient side. And, and we've seen that most of the investment go in on the primary care side. And we've seen even recent consolidation with Iora and One Medical. We're starting to see that play out on the specialty side as well. And so I think we're going to see a trend on what's going to be invested over the next coming year or two is a lot of new care delivery plays that are down the service line orientation. And so you're starting to see a lot of healthcare systems through COVID rethink their service line orientation and also think about what's actually happening in the capital markets on that front. So that's just one category we can, we can continue to talk about, but, but I'll let my other colleagues also um, have a run at it. Yeah, so Anne, you know, you're, you're to, to Keith's point, right, you're coming at this from a, as a provider and get your perspectives as you think about, you know, pure investment versus strategically aligning, you know, some of those, some of those plays with, with your current operations. Definitely. Um, I'll start sort of by way of introduction. I'm Ann Wellington. I lead the Cedars-Sinai Accelerator Program. So we bring in uh, early stage healthcare technology companies that are creating solutions that would be valuable to organizations like Cedars to spend a couple months here in Los Angeles collaborating closely with us to improve and accelerate their product development and hopefully create some solutions that are useful to our health system and other health systems like us. Uh, my background is entirely in healthcare IT. So I was at a startup, uh, I was at Epic for a while, um, and have worked pretty heavily on a different, a few different areas on the healthcare IT side prior to my current role. Um, Keith, a lot of things that you said sort of resonated in a really interesting way of mentioning kind of how incumbents are thinking about how do we move into this more digital first world? How do we make certain that as these new players enter the market from the primary care side, from the sort of pay provider side, how do we uh, continue to fulfill our current obligations to our patients and our current patient preferences, while also making sure we don't get left behind or disintermediated out of provide, continuing to provide care to patients, especially as sort of younger patients' preferences shift in how they're accessing care. What this leads to in terms of, you know, what are we looking for, what gets funded, things like that, is really there's uh, challenges we have now and we're looking for solutions that help us be as efficient and effective as possible in delivering care in our current care delivery models. And then looking ahead a little bit to say, what are the sorts of solutions that help us bridge a little bit into that digital first or um, digital also sort of models? So are there solutions that can help us make the transition? Because uh, being the uh, sort of risk averse large organizations that health systems are, it's not something that can sort of pivot on a dime and take on new things too quickly. But if there's solutions that can help us turn the ship a little bit, that's where we're saying, you know, this is where we need to go. Who can help us get there and make sure that we don't get left behind? Good question there, Anna. I mean, how much does the from a provider perspective, how much of the strategic initiatives and needs of an integrated delivery system come into play as you as you think about as you think about investments? Um, I'll speak for for us. I know every health system it's a little bit different whether they're investing primarily. Every health system has a venture fund. If they're investing primarily from a financial perspective or more strategically, we're very heavily on the strategic side. So as we're looking at, especially for the accelerator program that I run, as we're looking at companies to bring into that program, we have to see some applicability to our health system, our current needs, our strategic needs. We sort of pair companies that come into our program with health system leadership and the way they get excited about these solutions is they're solving a problem that we see today and that they want to not only think it's a good move sort of financially and strategically, but we're excited about using their solutions. So we definitely um, look for solutions that we would not only be an investor in, but a customer of. Great, appreciate it. And so Michelle, I know you're, uh, you come at this from a completely different perspective, right? Which is what makes this, this panel so so creative. Uh, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better for the audience and, and your views on the investment landscape. Sure. 
Sure. Thank you, Peter. So, um, yeah, so I'm at McKesson Ventures, about seven-year-old firm. We've made about 35 investments. And uh, we do come at it from a different perspective, but maybe a little more similar to Keith than most people think. So we are a corporate venture firm, but I would say if you're looking at the spectrum of corporate venture firms, we operate a little bit more like a traditional venture firm in the sense of, you know, we are we have the mindset of a traditional investor, financially focused, generating returns. Are we investing in companies with big market potential, great teams, unique differentiated products? Um, so that's kind of in the forefront of where we're investing. But obviously as a corporate investor, we're also thinking um, strategically too, right? And trying to think about insights that we can get about markets that McKesson plays in. And, you know, and in our mind, the goal is to kind of prepare for disruption, right? In terms of thinking about those markets, not necessarily trying to protect from disruption. Um, and, you know, think also then thinking about, are there some synergistic opportunities with some of the companies that we invest in uh, to work where it makes sense? So um, that's kind of an overview of uh, McKesson Ventures. So my background, I've been in healthcare my whole career early on. It was more public policy and strategy consulting. But then I had the fortune to spend the last 20 plus years actually operating. So um, I helped build one of the first digital health companies called Hippocrates, which was at the time, very simple, mobile, mobile uh, using a mobile device, Palm Pilots. So this was like pre-iPhone pre-Blackberry, dating myself, um, to get clinical information to doctors. And then most recently, I was at a company called WellTalk, and now I'm back on the investment side. Um, so I probably bring that unique perspective of kind of building companies from the entrepreneur side. Great. Michelle, I appreciate that. You know, we, we've all seen the current ecosystem in terms of the access to capital, the IPO market, certainly the emergence of, of SPACs. Um, we have a fair amount of, you know, early stage companies uh, with us with us here today. As we think about how either some of your portfolio companies or companies in general think about how to scale um, in the emergence of, of M and A and the like, how do M and A alliances kind of play into into that scaled model, or were there others that uh, organizations should be thinking out? thinking about and or any perspectives you might have on the, on the financing market itself in terms of, uh, you, know, you know, pros, cons, and opportunities. Uh, Keith, I know that, um, why don't we start with you? I, I know you've been in the vortex of a number of these, a number of these emerging companies vis-a-vis -vis those issues. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, we talk a lot at the firm about two different types. Is it a wedge play or is it a full solution play? And, you know, if you think about scaling a wedge play, um, I think you got to constantly be thinking about where that wedge fits into a bigger piece. I think some of the biggest challenges we have right now in health, but digital health investing, um, is people are just carving off every little slice of everything they can ever think of. Like if you look at a space that we spent, um, you know, everything we do is proactive, you know, I think Michelle and Anne were talking a little bit about this, but Michelle in particular, you know, we spend years examining market before we invest in a particular market. It's very rare that a company comes across our desk and we actually just say, oh, that's an interesting company. Let's invest. You know, we, we actually spend the time researching the problem area because of who our investors are. And so what we don't do is we don't throw a bunch of different companies at our investors. We actually look at problem areas and then think about who's in the market or may not be in the market. Sometimes when people aren't in the market, we'll actually start something from the ground up because of that. But back to the question on, on that front is, you know, these wedge plays or, or, or the space I was going to talk about was like the digital front door space was like all the jazz uh, a year and a half ago or whatever it was. You know, we spent a year plus looking at that market. And I can't tell you how many companies that did get funded uh, and did get a little bit of scale, you know, got out into the marketplace. And that market is kind of not as heated as it used to be. People are starting to figure out it's really just not about a digital chat bot. It's actually about care delivery. And if you have a full scale, back to the other side of what our argument is, that's a different scaling discussion. So my point on the wedge play is if you're in the wedge market and you're one of those players, you got to constantly be looking at like, where do we go to, you're either going to be the platform or you need to be part of a platform uh, to overuse that word. And 
I think we're going to see a lot of consolidation there. I think we're going to see a lot of down rounds in time. So I, I continue to be the naysayer. I can't wait for this market to blow up. Um, and I will say that every year, like any pundit, and hopefully one year I'll be right uh, when the valuations, we can all get on, get on with our work. I mean, we've been doing this type of work for 20 plus years at our firm. Uh, you know, we were first money in Frisia, get well network. Well, well before a lot of people thought this was an interesting idea to invest in digital health. So, you know, we're here to build large businesses back to your scaling point. And then on the flip side of that, you're starting to see a lot of businesses on the full stack solution side that actually don't need that many customers to scale. You've seen this historically in the payer market where you can get one or two of the large payers. And next thing you know, you got a 50 to $100 million business. We're starting to see provider full stack solutions with that same approach uh, because they, in essence, are a care delivery organization. And so we're starting to see organizations. We recently funded a company in the oncology at home space uh, called Reimagine Care, where if we get three or five different JVs with a, you know, a handful of, of, of uh, hospital and payer partners, that will be a hundred, $150 million run rate business. That's a very scaled business in our market. And then the last thing I'll say and, and, and try to be a little quiet is there's different inflection points of value and scale in healthcare IT or digital health or tech enabled services. You typically see these businesses get up to about 10 million and a lot of the businesses stall out. And you don't really hear too much about those anymore. The press releases are gone. The, the fancy people and the fancy VCs don't talk much about it anymore because those businesses like have stalled out on the growth pattern. And then you see that next inflection point from kind of 10 to sort of the up into the hundred range and people hit that inflection point and then something from an M&A sort of takes place. And you see other people that have the IPO pathway. So, you know, we have a company in the uh, healthcare staffing space that that is just, I can't believe how fast it's grown because of the labor trends that we have, but that's a complete company that potentially could go out on its own. And there's a lot of those types of companies. So there's just different inflection points on that value on the, on the scaling point to your, to your end. But back to my first point, I think we're starting to see a lot bigger plays than people are used to seeing from a funding vehicle. I mean, look at Bright. I mean, Bright completely reimagined what a payer could be. And I think they raised 950 million today or yesterday, whatever it was. Um, so, you know, we're seeing more and more of that. Yeah, great. Would love to, uh, maybe Michelle, it, it, you would love to get your perspective. Do you, do, you, do you see any of these emerging companies aligning with you know, some type of joint go-to-market alliance or the like, or, you know, on top of you know, Keith's comments, would love to get your perspective if you see that as a, as a trend in any way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with a lot of what Keith said. I think one of the things that hit home for me was about um, it. Well, it kind of, you know, it depends what type of company you are. One mistake I see a lot of companies make is putting the focus so much on the technology or the product, right? And, and you really have to think beyond the technology. It's not enough to have the best product or the best technology, right? How are you going to get to people? How are you going to get to customers? What type of partners do you need to do that, right? And who, who is already maybe targeting your market um, that you can piggyback on, right? Or develop partnerships and kind of thinking through those things earlier, I think is very important because that helps you then scale your company faster. And that's one of the, I actually uh, probably more um, optimistic. The valuations are very high right now. It's just the craziest time I've seen in my 20 plus years, but I'm still very bullish on the market because I think there's actually just things have fundamentally changed a bit in the sense of, you know, when I started in digital health in the late nineties, I mean, you were, you were having to convince people about why they should even talk to you, right? And I think someday we won't even be talking about digital health, right? It's just going to be healthcare <laughs> or technology. Um, but, you know, there's more acceptance today. I think you have more success stories. I mean, it, you know, there was, there was such a dearth of any kind of IPO exits a couple years ago. And, and then, you know, One Medical, Lavango, Teladoc, it started booming. And I think now... We have more success stories. I think with technology today, it's easier to set up and scale companies more quickly, assuming you have a good business model, 
right? Assuming there is a buyer for your product, et cetera. But versus when I started, right? A lot of times you had to build things yourself internally, right? And now there are other technologies that help you get to, um, that you can get scale faster. Um, and we're also just seeing more, re now we're at the point where there's repeat entrepreneurs in the digital health space, right? And so there's more experience, people have learned from their mistakes. So I think for all those reasons, I'm definitely cautious still, but I'm bullish on the future. There, there's just healthcare is such a large percentage of GDP and I still think we're scratching the surface. But back to the scaling point, I think it's thinking early about it. I think the other thing is focus, right? So to Keith's um, point, you know, even if you're not necessarily a company that can just have a few customers and build a very big business model, I've always been about focus, right? When I see companies going after multiple markets early in their lifespan and selling multiple products at the same time to those markets, it makes me a little worried, right? Because I want to see you doing a couple things well, scaling that, building a business, and then thinking about where else you go with that. So I, I think that would be the other thing about scaling. And then to Keith's last point about there's different stages of the company. That's so true. I've seen that in two examples of where I've kind of worked through from going from zero to a hundred million. And um, it also comes down a lot to the people, right? And so part of when I think about scaling is having the right people for those different stages of the company. Cause somebody who maybe was good for the initial stage, the zero to 10 million might not be the right person to then take you to the next stage. And I, I think that's something really important to think about. And I think, People are getting smarter at the companies I see thinking through that and what people and what partnerships do you need at the different stages of the company to continue to grow? Yeah. You know, Michelle, I, your, your point on, you know, too much focus on the technology itself really resonates with, with us because we see a lot of companies that, um, you know, are pitching the, the shiny new technology to either pay or and don't necessarily focus on, well, what's the healthcare problem you're solving? What's, what's that specific organization's issue to impact? And how are you solving that through a combination of people, process, and technology? Um, and it often leads to disinterest, right? Because they never really get to, what's the healthcare problem that we're solving for here? And Anne, I would imagine that as a, a, a provider, right, you, you know, as you think about and see some of these companies, right? That would be a big, big part of your filtering process. So we'd love to get your perspective on that as well. Yeah, I think from a scaling perspective, um, a lot of the points that folks made, very true. And one thing that really resonated with me, I think Keith, that you said, and Michelle, you touched on as well, is really understanding sort of the ecosystem that you're existing in and the different touch points within the workflow, because there's the technology that each individual company creates, but that doesn't exist in a silo, especially for a healthcare system. So whatever technology you're creating, if you haven't thought about how to technologically connect that to everything else that we have in the organization, and then how to connect that from a workflow perspective. So whether that's, how is this getting into the hands of providers or how is this getting into the hands of patients? and recognizing that doesn't exist in a vacuum that exists in the context of a lot of work that's already happening, having that understanding will help, uh, is much more important than having just the very best technology stack. So, you know, it's many people have said this before, but execution is the most important thing in being able to actually grow uh, a company and and bring on not only sort of patients, but provider systems. I saw in the Q&A a question about condition-specific digital health, and I think it actually relates to this really well, thinking about how do we sort of create scale um, and what Keith was saying about taking sort of small slices. When we're looking at really narrow condition-specific digital health, for an organization like ours, it can be challenging because we're trying to care for the whole patient. And so giving them one solution for hypertension and another solution for diabetes and another app for depression and another app for medication adherence 
is going to be more confusing than helpful. And so I think that as companies think about uh, growing and scaling, certainly everyone has to start somewhere, but understanding what's the patient population you're serving, what are the other uh, applications or other solutions that those patients might be using, that those providers might be using, and how do you grow within that ecosystem that already exists helps to make it more scalable and not just this sort of very narrow condition specific uh, application that can only be applicable to one condition in a certain set of patients, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's great advice for many of the entrepreneurs and, and you know, companies with that are that are in that emerging growth space. Um, you know, we 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 hit upon it a little bit in terms of valuation. Um, you know, from from through our lens, we see a tremendous de the demand side of the equation in healthcare from a digitization perspective, continuing to prevail driving valuation. I, I think we uh, would love to get each of your perspectives on the current valuation landscape. Is it sustainable? And what, and more, more importantly, what, what drives it through, through the lens of some of these emerging companies? And, and maybe Keith, you know, logically start with you, uh, get, get your perspective. Yeah, I let the cat out of the bag on this one already. Um, it's not sustainable. Um, and it's like anything, like, I think we I, honestly, like kidding aside, um, I think we have two to three years to run. I mean, if you talk to the wall street folks, if you talk to the crossover investors, the fidelities, the Wellingtons, you talk to the private equity guys and you talk downstream to where we all sit on the venture side, I think there's still an insatiable appetite. Um, and I think there's, realistically two to three years, which includes the IPO window, you know, albeit that inflation holds and doesn't continue to go up and the Fed doesn't have to move faster than um, they're saying they're going to move. Because um, that, that will bring this all to a screeching halt, in my, in my point. I, I think the, the thing that we talk about a lot is that mainstream folks have realized that 20% of GDP is a big thing. <laughs> and everybody is coming after this now. So back when, you know, number of us, you know, and went back to Epic, you know, Michelle's been in this for a long time. I've been in this for a long time. I, I mean, I can remember sitting on the ONC HIT standards committee when I was on that committee talking about and explaining what an API meant. And so we are so far past all of that, that the mainstream folks, it's no longer about, hey, is, you know, Silicon Valley really starting to get into this? Every subsect of, of, of any markets coming into this. And I think the expectations are changing. You know, we are, we have a broad thematic uh, around this idea of major provider platforms and mayor, major payer platforms are moving away from their legacy platforms into sort of what we call care anywhere platforms. And so with that shift, as we all see, and that's not just telehealth, right? That is, that is you're able to provide care in whatever setting is the most convenient and the power dynamics are underway shifting along with that. Now, reimbursement's nowhere near anything I'm talking about right now. But when you start thinking about that level of tectonic shift where consumerism and other things that we were kind of cutely talking about a handful of years ago now become the norm, we have a long way to go because we still have MedPAC arguing with CMS, arguing with AHIP about telehealth reimbursement and parity and what happens with public health emergency once that's done. So this will be a long transition. The last thing I will say, and it all ties to valuation, is it, it reminds me a lot of retail. It reminds me of retail's transition around digital transformation. The story I always give is if you remember going to Best Buy back in the day, when you bought something online, you'd walk into the front doors of Best Buy and you say, hey, I bought this online. Can I return it? And they look at you like you were crazy. They were like, you can't return that here. You bought that online. That's a separate operation. Like we're at the infancy of that with healthcare, right? Like the average healthcare system in this country has three to four telehealth providers. It's nowhere near the stuff that Ann knows well back in her Epic days or even Cedars, anywhere near the workflow. And so all this stuff has to be integrated. These asynchronous, synchronous, online, digital, retail, in-person, all this stuff has a, ten, in my opinion, a 10 to 15 to maybe even 20 year 
uh, transformation that's going to take place. And valuations are going to go like this through all that. So we're going to have peaks and valleys through that. So the current, I think we're definitely at the tail end of the current peak of valuation enthusiasm. I think it will come down like all things come down, but then we're going to have another major uptick as things really start taking hold in a very different way. Um, as we start seeing some of the reality of some of this work. The last thing I'll say here is the thing that I also talk about a lot about is where's the ROI? Until the pandemic, we have never seen demonstrable ROI with the digitization of healthcare. Meaningful use, the billions of dollars behind it, there is zero ROI. We're starting to see some of it, but it's very little. I wouldn't say zero. Um, but that's the other pathway and labor trends. If you look at labor trends up into the pandemic, everything has been up into the right in healthcare. That's what got us through the 08 downturn was healthcare hiring. And so if you think about this somewhere, and this is a, this is a really difficult thing for the healthcare community to understand because these are the community, you know, these are the largest employers. Like what is, you know, what is Cedars in the LA market? It's one of the largest employers, right? Along with UCLA and the other providers in that market. So as we start ticking that down and start automating more and more, you know, it's going to be an interesting GDP battle, but it's going to be an interesting community battle about what actually takes place. So I think those to the point, the punchline of your point on valuations, I don't think we should myopically think about the valuation point now in time. I think we're going to see peaks and valleys over the better part of the next decade as this transformation takes hold. Yeah. And I'll let you chime in on that. Uh, yeah. And um, I'll take off from the sort of uh, peaks and valleys and hype cycle, or however we want to go into sort of highs and lows, because I think the past year has provided us such an interesting forced experiment of everyone has to go virtual for at least some period of time. And so we switched so much of our care to virtual. And certainly that accelerated a lot of things. It never would have happened without that forcing function. And I think that excited, you know, a lot of people said, great, we're never going back to in the market said, oh, you know, now that this has happened, we'll never go back to in person as much. I think the reality was there's some specialties, there's some types of visits that that was confirmed that it was like, wow, once we started doing some of this virtually, this is more efficient. And there's others that we found the opposite of, you know, this, the technology is not there yet. The way we do the work isn't, it's not supporting it yet. And so I think there is sort of this peak right now, or maybe even six months ago of this optimism about now virtual care has taken off and there's no looking back. I think we'll see a little bit of um, stratification of, yes, there's some areas, some specialties that it does continue that once people have learned how to use the technology, that this works well, they can care for their patients well, they'll continue others that there will be a little bit of a pullback and we'll see some areas that it's less exciting, but maybe in a few years, those start to sort of catch up a little bit more. So I think there will be a huge sort of peak and valley just from the forcing function of the past 12 to 14 months. Um, and then a little bit of a steadiness of it goes up and down, but a little bit less. And so new technology comes out, things become more integrated, more types of care, more specialties can be uh, more covered by digital health. Michelle, I'll let you chime in. We, you know, we, it's interesting. We, we've got a number of questions, really good questions that fall into two or three key buckets around either bending the cost curve, value-based care, consumerism, which we'll delve into in a little bit here because I think the audience is, is clamoring for that. But Michelle, I want to get your final perspectives on valuation. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I would agree with both Keith and Anne. I mean, I, I do think there's peaks and valleys. And if you're if you're a C, an investor and you've been in healthcare for a while, you know, you're, you gotta be in it for the long haul, right? I mean, <laughs> the average company takes what, 10 plus years to build maybe a, a little faster these days. And now with SPACs, who knows? Um, but, you know, there, I agree, there are going to be peaks and valleys. I do think, though, that the floor is raised, though. So we're going to have peaks and valleys. But I think kind of going through this past couple years, the, 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 the floor is higher now. So I think we're at a, a slightly different level 
going through the peaks and valleys. But I got to tell you, it's tough trying to be a disciplined investor these days, right? If you're really thinking through like, you know, evaluating the company and you're saying, I really think this is worth X times revenue, right? And then you're getting blown out of the water, right? On deal after deal. So um, it's hard. I do think though that they're going to be, you know, the, the other interesting thing to me for this in this market right now is just, I probably have come around a little bit in my thinking on how much money you raise, right? So we've had several portfolio companies that were thinking about raising X amount, right? And then all of a sudden there's so much inbound interest right? And it went from a $30 million round to a $150 million round, right? And my philosophy has always been more of, you know, don't raise more money than you need, know exactly what you're going to do with the money. I still believe that, but I also probably am moving a little bit more towards, you know, there's, there's the argument to be made for building a moat, right? And raising a lot of money, and kind of cementing yourself as one of the leaders in the space and then kind of building from there. So I think that's one of the interesting things about the environment right now. And it's kind of like, do you wanna invest in a company that maybe doesn't know what they're gonna do with all of that money, but you have confidence in the team and that the market will move there, um, so. Yeah, oh, interesting. You know, so let's take a spotlight on, on a question, right? Because we've gotten a, a lot of good questions. One interesting one centered around, you know, the migration or continuous investment in consumer products, whether, whether they be wearables or otherwise. And, and, you know, has there been a demonstrable bridge towards bending the cost curve? And to your point, Keith, what is the ROI? Um, would love to get each of your perspectives on that, and I have a follow-up question on consumerism. But Keith, maybe uh, maybe start with you on on you know is the is the supply side of the equation really helping us you know bend the cost curve? I um, I'm probably biased as I whenever I'm biased, I always say I'm biased. So I'm probably biased uh, on this category. So like if you if you put a lot of that um, self actualization self data collection on its own. So let's just call it wellness. Let's just call it sort of general health. I still think it's a tough bet. I think it's a tough pull, um, especially with what, you know, even Apple, there's an article last week about Apple has such huge, you know, um, sites set on healthcare, but so far it hasn't really done much, you know, in terms of demonstrable progress. Um, I, I think it's a really tough category if it doesn't fit into something that's bigger. And so what I mean by that is, you know, I, I'm not a, a DTC investor, so I don't, you know, we don't, we don't deploy capital so people can um, spend it on Facebook and other places to say they should be doing it. So you won't see me in row or him or hers or any of that kind of stuff. Not saying I don't believe in like, that's a, that's a way through, but um, you know, I do believe in the B to B to C model. And so we have a, we have a, a, a company, uh, called season in the food as medicine space. And, you know, I think there's ways that are direct and I'm just kind of playing off of, you know, a Fitbit tracker or just a general wellness play or a general, like doing the right thing, play like food, like eating, like how base of the pyramid type of topic is that right? Food, which most people don't really understand. And, you know, what you intake, you actually can help you on the health side, go figure. Um, so I think you're going to start seeing more and more of those concepts on the general wellness and health that get uptaken into the enterprise. And so what I mean by that, that's where I think there's, it's an interesting play. I don't think it's an interesting standalone play. I think it's an interesting play when you start thinking about what does a, a recently diagnosed bladder cancer patient have to eat appropriately through a chemo protocol over the next two years of a journey to ensure that you have the best chances of survival on top of the medications that you're taking. I think that downstream health wellness type of activity, whether you're tracking, eating right, doing whatever, how does that fit up into that? I think is really interesting. Um, but on a standalone basis, I, I still think it's a tough putt. Yeah, yeah. Anna, Michelle, I'll let you I'll let you comment, particularly on the direct consumer. We did have a separate question on, you know, our views on merging growth companies, deploying capital in a direct consumer market. So I, I'll, I'll let each of you comment on on those as well. 
Go ahead, Michelle. Oh, okay. I was saying, well, we actually were in hymns. <laughs> so uh, we don't do direct to consumer that often, but you know, we'll probably talk about it later, Peter, with some of your thoughts on consumerism. But I mean, we we definitely believe consumerism is I, I wouldn't say a trend, which implies it's gonna go away, but you know, consumers are becoming more involved in their healthcare and that it's an interesting place to focus. I wouldn't necessarily you know, try to sell devices per se to a consumer as a business model, but but we do like that area. Um, but in terms of kind of B two B to C models and and playing off what Keith said, I mean, what I'm looking for is kind of the bigger picture platform play and how we're integrating the different aspects of health. And I think, you know, it's been over the last five years or so. But if you talk to a lot of the self insured employers and many of the payers, right, like they've really expanded their definition of health, right? It used to just be around physical health, right? And that's where trackers would come in and exercise. And, and, it's, and it's also moving, you know, to Keith's point, all right, more around nutrition, right? And social health and emotional health and financial health, right? And how all of those play together, um, which is, you know, I think that's why you're seeing a lot of interest in the behavioral health space. And, and you know, if you talk to a lot of the, the kind of new pri virtual primary care companies today, there's kind of no difference anymore between the mental health and the physical health, right? Like those are, are blending and becoming one. And so I think, you know, that's where I would tend to look at is like, who's the platform or the company thinking about bringing all of those different aspects of health together? And then also thinking about it across, as Keith was kind of mentioning, the whole um, patient journey, but I would rather call it consumer journey, because patient journey to me implies like just when you're getting care, whereas we know, especially with oncology patients, right, most of what happens to you is outside of the care setting, right? And so you know, how you're thinking about the consumer along the whole journey and all of the different aspects of health that may not necessarily be clinical, you know, and bringing all of that together. Yeah, yeah. And I'll let you, uh, some great questions, by the way, from, from the group, keep, keep them coming. We'll, we'll try to integrate them as best we can into the dialogue. Yeah, I think the interesting question on consumerism for us and similarly, uh, in the program I do and our overall investment, we don't do any direct to consumer. We're not experts on how to build a consumer wellness company. So we're very focused on the B2B technology space. But when I think about sort of companies as a whole that we're looking at, it's an interesting question of how do patients sort of self-identify their alliance with a healthcare provider. And so I think at a time when you weren't seeing a lot, getting a lot of care outside or at home or outside of visits, it was very easy for patients to say, I'm a Cedar sinai patient because I go see my doctor at Cedar sinai uh, every six months. And that was their sort of affiliation with the organization. I think the interesting thing about a lot of consumer apps is if there's an app that they're checking in with every day or referencing every day or a tool that they're using all the time, is there sort of a tipping point at which they start to feel like, oh, I get my care from uh, the digital health solutions that are consumer facing, but that I'm using really regularly and the providers that I'm seeing are somewhat secondary to that. And so I think the sort of area of interest for me that I think about is how do we bridge that gap of making sure that uh, we continue to sort of stay forefront as a provider in the patient's mind, even if we're not, um, even if they're not coming in on a super regular basis, or maybe they are, but keeping that sort of uh, brand identity with them of their a patient who's being seen by our providers. Yeah, no, super interesting. I think we're, we're, we're going to go to a, what I'll call a, a quick hit Q&A. So kind of a yes, no with, with under a sentence, you know, why, right? You know, we, we, we had planned to talk a lot about data analytics, artificial intelligence, um, you know, kind of the impact on our, on our business. You know, do, do we see organizations with those contemporaneous solutions? Um, do we see more funding in the future for those organizations? Yes or no? Um, and, and why from your perspective? And I'll, 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 let, uh, I'll let that season and, and ask for volunteers. 
Data and analytics, yes. AI, yes. Uh, but I think for AI, what is the AI actually doing? Like there's a lot of marketing about AI right now. Yeah. And your, your perspective? Um, data and analytics, maybe. I want data and analytics and actionable recommendations. So just analyzing something, we need to get all the way there. We just, like, just analysis is not that helpful. Um, agree with Michelle on AI. I think every company I look at tells me right now they're an AI company and then we dig into it and it's, they will someday aspire to be an AI company once they have enough data. So, um, eh, yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Keith, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with both of them. I, I mean, I don't, um, I, I, again, maybe I, I won't say it, but I, I don't think we'd ever invest in just a data and analytics or an AI company today. Just, I just don't think we would do it. Now there's some outliers in just the data and analytics play. Like we did something in the social determinant space that was really interesting in that, but, but they've got to be more. And it's really just part of the stack now. I mean, a lot of these things just become embedded part of the solutions in, in our minds. Now you have to prove it out to Anne's point, because I think that's, that's the key because everybody says it and most don't have it or, or have to build towards it. But the human resources side of that is, is, is no small thing right now. Yeah, that's right. And then, and so I'll, I'll pull on a bit through, through our lens we see data analytics in our, as capabilities that need to be integrated into a solution, whether it be software or otherwise, and not a standalone organization per se, unless it's linked to a specific issue to impact or accelerates one of those capabilities. So hopefully that was somewhat responsive. Um, I think in today's world, we'd be remiss if we didn't speak a little bit about cyber. There's also a regulatory component here. There are a number of questions on that. Uh, I'll maybe add a bit of a flavor to this and say, you know, what is the what is the regulatory change that you think would be most impactful to accelerate either the uh, acceptance of digitization or the acceleration of, of those organizations in today's ecosystem? Is there, you know, a, a holiday wish list for the kind of the type of regulatory change that you'd like to see? only because we've also seen some questions on value-based care. So I'll give you that broader kind of regulatory landscape to, to answer that. And again, uh, we'll let that simmer and ask for volunteers. Um, I'll weigh in just very briefly on cybersecurity. It is so high on the list of concerns for health systems right now and higher every day. So I think especially for uh, early stage companies, when when our security, our cybersecurity folks look around at where are potential risks to the health system, their eyes often land on uh, early stage companies. So I think uh, entrepreneurs should expect a uh, increasing level of scrutiny on their security practices as hospitals worry about ransomware and cyber attacks. Just piggybacking on that because I know Ann knows this too but you know we this is such a serious topic it has been for a while that we actually helped create a company with Cedars and Intermountain and MGB uh, part, formerly partners a company called Sensinet to basically catalog all of the third-party risk across a provider's footprint um, and you know that's that's when you know the market, is not necessarily reacting. It, it, it's reacting, but it's not reacting in a deep way to the sensitive needs of healthcare providers per se, and in time payers and life science as well. There's some, there's some generalist platforms out there, but not at the depth by which some of the needs are here. So, so Pete, to your point, you know, we, we've taken this area very seriously and, um, uh, you know, put our money where our mouth is, which is, yeah, we'll put money up, but let's go build a company in this area because we don't see something out in the market that actually fits the deep needs of, of PHI, HIPAA, clinical workflows, and the proliferation of digital health players that, to Ann's point, you know, most days, nine, or nine times out of 10, most of these companies never done a pen test, let alone pass a SOC 1 or a SOC 2, right? But most healthcare providers today, if you haven't done a SOC 2 and you haven't done a pen test every six months, you're not getting through the walls but it's very lackadaisical. A lot of times these assessments and understandings of these companies are one and done. And then these companies, as we all know, change code all the time. The other question is, is where does your data live? 
So the average startup is obviously building on AWS or something like Azure or something like that. And, but, but that spread is also out there. There's certain things up the stack that AWS is doing to say that, that your data is secure. But if you don't, op- if you don't configure a container a certain way in AWS, we've seen this in the public press many times, total open, open port to be able to get into somebody's stack, even though it sits on AWS's uh, infrastructure. So there is an enormous uh, opportunity here. I would argue that the landscape needs to understand the threat vector a lot more than they do today on one side of it. And then the other side of it, which I used to present to my board at Premier is we all have, we all have homes where most of us have homes. We all have locks on our windows and we have locks on our doors. And if somebody wants to get in, they're going to get in. And so as much as we can put more locks on our windows and things of that degree, it's really not necessarily about all the tooling. It's about things like SenseNet and other things like that, that actually tell you where your crown jewels and your issues are. So you're continually watching those areas in a surveillance-like way and watching the external market to understand how much of a threat are you under today compared to what you were yesterday compared to what you were another day. I once got told a story, I won't tell the vendor, but it's a big vendor, um, that somebody who's a very prominent CIO or was a very prominent CIO did an analysis of this vendor. And this vendor thought that they were foolproof. This vendor had 990 security flaws with its cloud-based infrastructure. Nothing was done for two to three years with that particular vendor. And it was in almost every health system around this country. So... This problem is not only omnipresent, it ever changes every day, and no one tool is actually going to fix it, but the posture, as you know, probably Peter and Deloitte knows better than anybody, is, is the posture that gets managed day in, day out is really the way that's that way that we're going to know about the problems, because the problems are going to exist no matter what we do. Yeah, that's right. My only two points for that piling on is, one, human capital on this is very difficult to find. Finding talented people who can help in this regard is difficult. And two, to your point, if, if you know if someone wants to breach you, you'll get breached. And in, in, in all likelihood, all four, all four of our organizations are being breached you know, as we speak. The question is to what degree and how you respond to your customers in organizations that you serve. Is, is the key aspect of this. Michelle, I'll let you uh, chime in on that. I do want to get to the holiday regulatory question. Okay. We have about eight minutes left. Yeah, we, I think uh, Anne and Keith did a great job talking about cybersecurity. So. Yeah, great. I appreciate that. So from a regulatory perspective, because the question's come up a couple of times in, in the chat here, um, you know, is there a regulatory change that would be most impactful to accelerating the digitization of healthcare. I mean, we saw some of the regulatory changes with telehealth that occurred during coronavirus. You know, what's on your wish list? What's the what's the one thing you'd like to see from a regulatory perspective? Um, on telehealth, this actually isn't regulatory. Sorry, I keep not answering the regulatory question. But um, I think the telehealth question right now is there's been regulatory changes, but those don't necessarily apply to all payers. So right now we're also in a weird space where different payers are going to reimburse different amounts for remote patient monitoring and things like that. And so we're trying to do a lot of analysis on given payer mix, what solutions make sense to implement and what don't based on what they're, what codes they're reimbursing for. Um, And so if that would become more standardized and more, uh, we're more reliable in terms of we know we're going to get paid on these codes from uh, every pair we submitted to that would help adoption a lot because even though the regulatory changes have helped it doesn't apply to every play every payer. Got it, Michelle I'll let you. Uh... Oh, yeah. So I, it's interesting. I mean, I, I could think Which of other areas, but I, oh, Peter, um, you know, I, I would kind of agree actually with what Anne said because you know, for example, the 
one of the areas I'm definitely interested in made an investment re recently is, is kind of in the virtual care space, right? Which is kind of going beyond telehealth, right? Like to me, telehealth 1.0 is just, we're practicing business as usual, but we're going to be able to do some of it remotely now, right? Vers versus how do you rethink providing care from a virtual first approach and then think about filling in where you need bricks and mortar, right? Or a different way to do bricks and mortar, maybe like an Airstream trailer or whatever it is. And so to the degree we just keep making progress there and there's more, you know, uh, I guess standardization, right? And acceptance of that, I actually think that helps build out a lot of these other virtual first models that are fundamentally different than what people talk about as telehealth today. Keith, I'll let you uh, chime in on the, on the regulatory wish list. I, I don't uh, have per se a wish list, and maybe I'll attack the VBC comment, the value-based care question too, tied into that. Um, yeah. I, used to, I used to be a believer that VBC was the way through. I actually am not anymore. Um, I had the luxury of building up the ACO collaborative when I was at Premier with about 70 different uh, markets across the country. And I was, I was like full religion. Um, you know, now I believe it's just another mechanism. And so I think some of these regulatory pieces are really important. I think value-based care programs are important just as, you know, fee-for-service is a runaway train as we know, but it's a mechanism that we know and it's a mechanism that we've grown through history and the different programs uh, that have come up. So I think there has to be continued evolution of the payment program sort of uh, in infinity, meaning that, you know, as the market changes, as, as, as it changes, you know, it might not be value-based care. It might be something else that we, we dream up. Um, but we are a product of our reimbursement uh, history. And I think a lot of people don't truly understand how the inpatient perspective system got developed and the outpatient perspective system got developed and all the things that took place. And we are where we are because of the, 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 <laughs> the Gordian knot that we have created over the years uh, uh, as different people have flown in and out of the government on the reimbursement strategy. But I think it's just a continual progression of these types of programs. And the other thing that people I don't think realize and we should spend more time on and the startup community definitely doesn't get is all the innovation in healthcare takes place at the state level. And anything that happens at the federal level is usually after something has been tested out in a state or a couple of states. And I think what would be so interesting is if we saw more early stage companies actually start back to Michelle's point on focus, being very focused and maybe aligning itself with a state or a couple of states, building out the basis of the platform. And we've seen a couple of these companies come by and do that and then roll out from there. But I think that's a missed piece. I think, you know, when people start talking about healthcare policy and things like that, people don't really understand healthcare policy and actually how it gets developed. But the startup community on the next turn of the startup community in healthcare, I think that's going to be the next level of, of uh, sort of all knowing, if you will, when you start building these companies in a differentiated way. Yeah, you know, I, I actually, we actually agree with that quite considerably. I mean, we've seen a, we've seen a few emerging companies that focus on the Medicaid product that have kind of chosen because of the kind of the reimbursement mechanism to focus on, you know, one or two states or a series of states. But uh, for the most part, you're right. Um, well, a little time check. We have two or three minutes left. Um, why don't we just kind of round robin, you know, half a minute or so. What's your best advice to, to uh, some of the entrepreneurs and uh, executives, uh, you know, on the webcast today, and then we'll close it out. Uh, I'll just reiterate some of the advice I gave earlier about make sure that you understand Within. So both the patient ecosystem of all the solutions they might be using, and then the health system ecosystem of we have 400 software applications that we're supporting. And so adding new technology solutions requires us to think about not only is this a great solution as sort of a point solution or a standalone, but how does this fit into our overall strategy and technology staff or technology? Yeah. Michelle, I'll let you... Uh... Let you chime in. Yeah, I mean, I 
kudos to all the entrepreneurs on the call. I mean, I know what it's like. I've been there. It's hard. I'd say, you know, focus, uh, think beyond the technology, uh, really understand your audience. And what I always would say is, and even I think about this as an investor, right? Who's not going to be happy if you're successful, right? And I think about that when I'm designing my model, because I'll have some entrepreneurs where I talk to them, they say, I say, who's your competition? And I'm like, oh, we don't really have any competition. There's no company that does exactly what we do. And I'm like, wrong answer. Yeah. You're not getting my money. Um, no, I might still invest. But um, and the last thing I think it's healthcare is a long road. It's a tough haul for being an entrepreneur and being an investor, and you have to be um, patient in this market, and you have to be persistent. So great advice, uh, Keith. I'll let you finish up. Sure. So I agree with both. I agree with both those points, and you know maybe just to be additive to the group uh, comments is. On the business model, the point that Michelle made about whose cheese are you moving is important. And there's really, there's really two business models most days that the entrepreneurs need to be a bit more prescriptive, at least when they're talking to us. Are you building a business that there's an existing revenue stream that you're moving? That is a lot easier than the second point I'm going to make, which is you're building a new revenue stream in healthcare that does not exist today. And if you're going to do the latter, you know, understand what you're doing uh, and understand the level of, of execution risk that you have. Not saying it's impossible because that's where you really change the world, but you also got to think a lot bigger in that second idea um, because you are starting to think about changing the world a bit. So anyway, just a thought. It was a lot of fun talking with everybody. That was great, Keith. I really appreciate it. Uh, some great feedback and questions. JD, thank you. He just for the group, uh, he said it was one of the better webinars he's attended. That's a pretty high hurdle during coronavirus. So I, we, we do appreciate that. Uh, we, we do try to spend a fair amount of time. If there were questions or follow-up uh, that you think are pointed to any of us, by all means, you have our contact information, certainly reach out. I wish each of you the best of luck and health as you uh, kind of migrate the, uh, the, the, the change towards uh, you know, a new hybrid, you know, work model and, uh, and the like. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your uh, collaboration with HELP. Uh, and we do, all of us appreciate the time and effort that HELP has put into this. And we hopefully look forward to uh, being together in Boston in, in October. Thank you for your time. We do appreciate it.